Hey guys, in this lesson, let's talk about two sample t-tests. So we will cover how to use t-tests for independent samples and dependent samples. For independent samples, there are two scenarios. One is that the two samples have equal variance, and the other scenario is that the two samples have different variances, and we will cover both scenarios in this video. Let's start with some interview questions. Calculate the mean difference and the standard error of mean difference for two sample t test. Implement two sample t tests in Python or R. As you can tell, you need to know how to calculate the test statistic for two sample t tests so that you can implement in Python or R. And in this lesson, we'll cover all the things you need to know to ace this kind of interview questions. Let's start with independent samples. So let's say x1 and x2 are random samples from two independent populations. Each population is approximately normally distributed. The samples within each population are independent of each other. So let me specify what independent samples mean. Independent samples or unpaired samples means that there's no relationship between the subjects in each sample. Subjects in the first group cannot also be in the second group and no subject in either group can influence subjects in the other group. Also, no group can influence the other group. So that's what independent samples or unpaired samples mean. For two sample t-tests, we have two hypotheses. The null hypothesis is that the mean of the first population is the same as the mean of the second population. And the alternative hypothesis is that the two are not the same. Let's see what are the steps involved to conduct independent t-tests. We first calculate the difference among sample means, and then we sum the variances of the samples and calculate the equal or unequal variances. So there are two scenarios here. Uh, the two groups may have equal variances or unequal variances. And then we calculate the t-statistic and compare it with the t-critical value. If the t-statistic is larger than the t-critical value, we reject the null hypothesis. These steps are pretty straightforward, right? Now let's dive into two sample t-tests with equal variances. This is a scenario that the two groups of variances are believed to be equal. Then we use a t-test based on pooled variance estimate. So this is what the test statistic looks like. It's x1 bar minus x2 bar over sp square root of 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. xi bar is the sample mean of sample i. For i is 1 or 2. And the pooled sample variance sp squared is defined by sum of squares 1 plus sum of squares 2 over n1 plus n2 minus 2. Sum of squares is the sum of squares of a data point xj to the sample mean xi bar. Under the null hypothesis, the test statistic, the t statistic, follows a t distribution with degrees of freedom n1 plus n2 minus 2. Essentially, the numerator is the difference between these two sample means, and the denominator is the sample standard deviation of the difference. We can also derive the confidence interval for two sample t tests with equal variances and the level 1 minus alpha, 100% confidence interval for the difference between two means is x1 bar minus x2 bar plus or minus t n1 plus n2 minus 2 alpha over 2 multiplied by sp square root of 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. So this part is the point estimate, and this part is the margin of error. Now let's look at how to use the Welch's t-test with unequal variances. If the two variances are not similar, one is more than twice of the other, but the other assumptions for the two sample t-test hold, then we can use Welch's t-test, which employs an unpooled standard error. So the unpooled standard error is the square root of s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. Our test statistic becomes x1 bar minus x2 bar over square root of s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. As you can see, the numerator is the same as the equal variance scenario, but the denominator is different. Here, s1 and s2 are sample standard deviations of the two groups, and we calculate them separately. The degrees of freedom is a little bit complicated. It's s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2 squared 
over s1 squared over n1 squared over n1 minus 1 plus s2 squared over n2 squared over n2 minus 1. So the difference between the equal variance scenario and the unequal variance scenarios are two things. The denominator is different as well as the degrees of freedom. Now we cover lots of the theories. Let's look at an example to compare the mean height of men in two cities. We have two samples here. One sample has 19 data points and the other sample has 23 data points. We simulate some data and run the test in Python. Right? We assume the two populations have different variances. For the first population, the standard deviation is 1.97 and mu1 1 is 172. So we can sample 19 data points from the population. Of course, we don't have access to these parameters. This is just for illustrative purposes. For the second sample, there are 23 data points. The standard deviation is 2.2 and the mean is 169. Using the Velches t-test, we can test if the mean height difference is close to zero with 95% confidence level. So mu zero is zero here. Unput standard error can be calculated by using the sample variance over n1 plus the sample variance of the second sample over n2, and then we take the square root of this quantity. We can also get the observed t-score using the difference between the two sample means minus zero, which is mu zero here, over the unput standard error. The degrees of freedom is a little bit complicated here. We need to plug in the equation and then calculate the critical t-score based on the degrees of freedom. In this case, the observed t-score is close to four, but the critical t-score is 2.02. .02. So we land in the rejection region and there's a statistical significant difference between the heights of men in the two cities. Now let's see how we can derive the confidence interval for the difference between two population means. A level one minus alpha 100% confidence interval for the difference between two means is shown here. It's x1 bar minus x2 bar. The difference between the two sample means is a point estimate. And then we have margin of error, which is a critical t value multiplied by the unput standard error. The unput standard error is the square root of s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. s1 and s2 are sample standard deviation. And the degree of freedom here is a little bit complicated. It's s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2 and take the square of this quantity. That's our numerator and the denominator is s1 squared over n1 squared over n1 minus 1 plus as 2 squared over n2 squared over n2 minus 1. Let's say an example to derive the confidence interval for the difference of height of men. So we continue using the previous example. We can get the margin of error, which is a critical t-score, multiplied by the unpooled standard error. And then we obtain the lower bound of the confidence interval is the difference between the two sample means minus margin of error. And the upper bound of the confidence interval is the difference between the two sample means plus margin of error. That's how we can obtain the confidence interval using the point estimate, which is the difference between the two sample means and the critical t-score, as well as the unput standard error. Finally, let's look at using the t-test for dependent samples. Dependent or paired samples means that each data point in one sample is uniquely paired to a data point in the second sample. For example, we want to measure change over time in a longitudinal study. We measure one variable at one point in time and measure the same variable of the same sample at a later point in time. Or we want to compare pre-test and post-test difference. We want to see if there's a significant effect due to the treatment. Then we have two dependent samples. There are some advantages of this kind of design. It controls for individual differences. But there are also some disadvantages, like there's carryover effect. The second treatment can be affected by the first treatment, and the order may influence the results. Which treatment is first can affect the results. Now let's look at the hypothesis for testing the difference between dependent samples. Let d1, d2, dn be a small random sample of the differences in pairs. Our null hypothesis is that mu d equals mu zero, and our alternative hypothesis is mu d is not the same as mu zero. 
almost always mu0 equals zero. So basically we want to test if the difference between dependent samples is zero or not. The steps to conduct dependent heat tests is very similar to conduct independent heat tests. We first calculate the difference of the pairwise differences, and then we obtain the standard deviation of the pairwise differences, and then we can calculate the t-statistic and compare the t-statistic with the t-critical value. If the t-statistic is larger than the t-critical value, we reject the null hypothesis. Here's the form of the t-statistic. t is d bar minus mu0 over sd over square root of n. d bar is the average of the differences. mu0 is the average of the differences under the null hypothesis. Typically, it's zero. And sd is the standard deviation of sample differences. Under the null hypothesis, the test statistic follows a t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Now let's say an example to evaluate the effect of stretching on height. Let's say we measure the height of a group of people who do not stretch regularly. Then they start stretching regularly for a year. Then we measure their heights again and take the differences. You want to see if there's a statistically significant effect, meaning that if the population mean differs from zero. Here we have a total of 20 data points and the sigma is 0.01 population mean is zero. We sample the difference from this population, but we don't have access to the sigma nor population mean here. Our mu zero here is zero because we want to see if the population mean differs from zero. And we can calculate the observed t-score, which is the difference of the samples minus mu zero over sample standard deviation divided by square root of n. And we can compare the observed t-score with the critical t-score. Here's the observed t-score is a negative value, and its absolute value is less than the critical t-score. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So there's probably no change in height after the additional stretching. Finally, we can derive the confidence interval for dependent samples. A level 1 minus alpha, 100% confidence interval for the mean difference mu d is given by d bar plus or minus t n minus 1 alpha over 2 multiplied by standard deviation of d over square root of n. If the sample size is large enough, typically more than 30 data points, then the confidence interval for the mean difference mu d is d bar plus or minus z alpha over 2 s d over square root of n. So we replace the t critical value with the z critical value. All right, that's it for this lesson. We went over using the t-test for independent samples as well as dependent samples. For the independent samples, there are two scenarios. Either the two groups have equal variances or they have unequal variances. That's it for this lesson. I will see you in the next one.